Louis Zamperini grew up a son of an immigrant Italian family. He had an older brother, and if I got the order of family correct, he had two younger sisters. But at the age of 10, he was already into trouble. <laughs> I don't know if that correlates with any of us in here. But he was already in trouble because he was smoking, and he was, this was during the Depression, during, the, during Prohibition, and he was stealing booze and drinking at the age of 10. And he got a kick out of it. He got a delight out of it. And he got beat up by some of the, because he couldn't speak very good English, perhaps, or just because he was, his parents were, uh, were Italian. He got beat up, and, and so he, his dad taught him how to box. And so he got delight. He got delight in becoming good and protecting himself and, in fact, inflicting a damage on those that were, had beat him up. He was a tough kid. So tough that he was getting into trouble, and the police came and said, do something, parents, do something with this child, this, this man, this boy man, that is either going to change his life or he's going to go to jail. And so, thankfully, God had a plan. God had parents that would, would stood behind him, and they asked for the help from his older brother, who, who was a track star at that time. And basically, he took, took Louis under his arm, and he said, you were going to run. Louis didn't want anything to do with it, but he, that or not being in the family, so he started running. In high school, for three years, after he finally got in shape and ran the smoke out of his lungs and, and started to work out in, in a productive way, in high school, he had three years of, un he was undefeated. He had the national record for the high school. He made it to the Olympics. He didn't think that he was ready, but he switched from the mile to, to the 5,000, and in that, qualified for the Olympics. In the Olympics, which was during the world, prior to World War II, it was in, in Nazi Germany. Uh, he ran in the race, didn't win it, but the very last lap, he ran so fast, I think 55 seconds, he ran so fast that everybody marveled at that, including Hitler. And so Hitler wanted to see him afterwards, and he remembers, that is, Louis remembers, that he shook hands with Hitler at that particular time. He went back to, to college, or went into college, became a national champion in college, and then World War II wanted to, to, now that he was ready, that he had matured, wanted to go to another Olympics, but there was no Olympics in Japan because of the war. He became a bombardier. In the, in the matter of war, he was, he, the, the plane crashed, and for 47 days, first two companions, then one, survived by drinking rainwater, fish that they could keep, so that they could catch, and also any birds that were close. It was not good food. It was not good food, but he survived. Survived and, 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 and to, be, to be found but only found by the Japanese. Because of that, then put into a concentration camp where he met, or a prison camp, where he met the bird, is what the nickname was. He was a psychopath. After the war, Louis was asked about that, and other people that were in that camp were, were asked about that, and all the Americans agreed he was a psychopath. He had no, had no right or wrong. He wanted to, to just inflict as much punishment on Louis as possible. They, they also checked with the prison guards, with the other Japanese prison guards. What did they say about the bird? He's a psychopath. So it was that kind of existence that he had through that camp. Surviving, coming back, coming back, and then as a war hero, being welcomed, getting married to his wife, Cynthia, and then in those few years, immediately afterwards, going through the greatest battle of his life where he almost lost his wife, but he did not. But before we get to that, let's take a look at the trailer, which talks a little bit, shows some of the high. It is a dramatic story, a dramatic movie. Its emphasis is upon, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit, the emphasis is upon um, uh, the brutality. Uh, it doesn't talk about the whole story. And part, part of that reason is because Angelina Jolie was, is a, a, I guess, apparently an agnostic, and perhaps thought that you know if you put into the rest of the story, it just wouldn't be, wouldn't sell. Unfortunately, he said she didn't want it to be a Billy Graham type movie. Unfortunately, this was a Billy Graham type story. It was a Billy Graham story. When we look at the scripture that Paul gives us, we see the words that 
bring this together, this, this type of survival, this type of overcoming obstacles with the, the things that we have to suffer in our life, the suffering that we have. And the text is, that was, was used for the children already, we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. So we have perseverance, which is also can be translated endurance. And we have perseverance, which brings character, which brings hope. It is similar, but not the same as one of the statements that, uh, that Louis used, or was used by his brother to him, that says, one moment of pain is worth a lifetime of glory. One moment of pain is worth a lifetime of glory. Now, when you think about that as far as athletics is concerned, you can see where that does indeed make sense, or surviving, or just getting through, or just make it through a rough time. We know that in athletics, it all depends upon the situation, because there are times when pain should not be ignored. And we're talking about pain that would stop you from, from healing and, and would prevent you from continuing as far as your, your athletic abilities are concerned. But there are moments in life which are painful. There are moments in life where if we survive, what we get is certainly worth it. When we look at the movie itself and we think about it as far as how relevant it is to us, what does it say about the world? What does it say about culture? Is it true? Does it say that, that, uh, that evil will be overcome? It definitely shows evil in the form of, well, you could say war by itself is evil, and that certainly is true. People were dying. Situations of life are very difficult, but you can also hone in on that particular individual who made it his purpose of life to, to break down Louis Zapparino, and he did not. His nickname, as I referred to it before, this individual, that was evil, and there are evil people in this world, was nicknamed the bird. So to some degree, this movie does show natural law, it does show obstacles, it does show overcoming, and that is indeed what God gives us. That is truthful and, and meaningful and helpful. When we look at the, what is missing, though, when we look at what's not in the movie, because it wasn't put into it, we get the full story. We see that, that Louis Zapparini came back from the war and he was a hero. He had everything to go for him. He had survived. He had done things that nobody else could have possibly done because of his perseverance, because of his character, because of his hope. But it wasn't quite aligned right, was it? It wasn't quite aligned right. And what aligns it? What puts it in the right place? The right place is knowing that there is hope in the glory of God, knowing that indeed, because of God's grace, we are a pearl. We have an identity that is not ours. Yes, it is true that the wages of sin is death. And Billy Graham said it that night, that Louis went, kind of forced, but went uh, into uh, that camp, that big tent, and he heard these words. So he heard those words, but he heard other words. So when we look at that statement and try to work these two together, one moment of pain is worth a lifetime of glory, and it's true, but it doesn't tell the full story. The rest of the story, what the movie doesn't show, we have parts of this in this next clip. Some of it is just a repeat, a, a, a further, uh, a further uh, explanation of the movie, and some of it talks. You get to see Louis himself. He no longer is living. He died at age 97 just this past year. Let's take a look. Became an inspiration to the world. The first of it, I think it's important for everybody. Don't give up. Don't give in. There's always an answer to everything. Oops. 
Louis Zamperini said, he was often asked and told, you are an optimist, aren't you? And he said, well, an optimist says the glass is half full, a pessimist says the glass is half empty, a realist says, that's a glass, fill it up. I want to drink it all. And so that was how he maybe, in a, in a, if we want to try to condense his, his uh, thoughts and, and what he believed, uh, that says it, I think, says it well. When he came back, and which the movie only gives just a little bit in, in uh, a printed word, it doesn't show anything about this at all. When he came back is when the real battle began. And the battle was when he became, because of the post-traumatic uh, stress that he had, he became very angry and upset. And he wanted to destroy, he wanted to kill Bird. And, and at nighttime, this would overcome him. In fact, once his wife, Cynthia, woke up with Louis' hands around her, her neck, he thinking that this is what he's doing, killing this enemy. He drank, he drank heavily. Finally, his wife said, I am, I'm leaving, I have to leave. But she had came in an acquaintance with some Christian friends. And they said, come with us to go to Billy Graham's, uh, the, the outside uh, gathering that is going on. And Billy Graham's popularity was just beginning at that time. They were finding out about him, and it got bigger and bigger, and, and more weeks were added on. And he resisted that. He resisted that. I also heard that John Wayne was a friend of Louis Zamperini and encouraged him. But with encouragement, in fact, trying to get away from uh, being pestered, uh, being, being constantly pestered, uh, he finally went. And now this is the rest of the story. And the rest of the story is that Louis Zamperini sat there and heard these words, for the wages of sin is death. He heard this and he said, I always knew that Jesus was the Son of God. I always knew that, but I never felt that in my heart that I had that relationship. That's my words, how I would put that, how I, how I was connected to Jesus. And he said, and these are some of the other words that he heard during that time. This is in his autobiography, and this is a passage that was very real to him. For there is no... It is in Romans 3, 22. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then in, in John 14, 6, it says, Jesus says, said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When he heard those words, he said, I stood up, I walked to the aisle. If I turned to the left, I would walk out. If I turned to the right, I would walk forward and confess indeed that, that God had placed me here, that faith was in my heart, and that he was my savior. He turned to the right. He confessed his sins. And he said, and now this is miraculous. You heard about the miraculous thing that happened when he was pinned uh, in the plane and yet he was released somehow. What was miraculous, he said, is that from that moment on, and it wasn't like there was a flash of red, uh, red uh, of lightning, uh, a flash of white, white uh, uh, brightness, but rather it was a sense of peace. He said from that moment on, he never struggled again with the anger and the hatred that he felt. He never, ever struggled again with alcoholism. In fact, from that point on, he became very, in his life became working with youth, teaching them, directing them, having them overcome the obstacles in their life. Later in his life, he went to Japan and he forgave all of the prisoners, uh, excuse me, all of the guards that had persecuted him, with one exception. He wanted to, but he could not meet the bird. The bird would not meet him. Now, when we take this story, which is a marvelous story, which says, indeed, that for, for a moment of pain is worth a lifetime of glory, and we can think of that lifetime of glory, not, not just here on this earth, but also a lifetime of glory that we have. But what does it have to do with what's going on right now? And I do, indeed, think 
Not that we're special, I guess, but I do indeed think that we have been, this group right here has been attacked in many ways. Things are coming that are difficult. I can't do a statistical study and say that it is beyond what is normal, but it sure feels that it is beyond what is normal. I see people that are hurting because of illness, of separation. I see people because of, 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 of friends being killed just a few days ago. A biker being struck down by a hit-and-run driver, a friend. I see that happening, and I'm saying, well, how do we deal with this? How do we handle this? And I think of survival, and I think of, of what we have in our text. And that is, is that, that, that these types of things bring perseverance, and perseverance brings character, and character brings hope. But it's not just that easy to say those words because you know what it feels like to be blindsided. It is that easy, but in some sense, it's not that easy because you know what it feels like to be blindsided, to have your, literally, your, your guts wrenched out, feeling so, so down because of it, fighting whatever it might be. And so how do we look at that as something that, not that we praise God for, but in the midst of it, we praise God. And see, Paul gives us these words, the link, which you already have, but let's link it even tighter. Paul gives us these words. It is found in Romans 5, 1 to 5, the, the, what we did not read of what, of, uh, of what we're using today as far as our theme text. It says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have been changed. Things that are different. We are not the same because of God's grace. We are standing. Our Lord Jesus is standing beside us. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that because of that faith that we have, that we're justified, we know indeed that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. So reading all of the texts, reading everything that's before and after, we get an understanding that is not just tough it out and it'll get better, although that sometimes that is very, very, very important. We live one day at a time. But it is that God is always with us. And those illnesses that, that are crushing those things that happen that we don't and can't understand. Sin. Some of it is our own sin. Some of it is because of the sin of the world. The world is not perfect anymore. There is death in this world, and yes, but death does not overcome us. It's not, a, it's not the victory. It's not the victory. Once when Paul was challenged, and it's written in the second letter of the Corinthians, when Paul was challenged, as far as whether or not he was a true apostle. Should you really be speaking to us, Paul, is really what they said. We have other people here that say that you're not really close to God, that your gospel is not what the gospel is true. And Paul said, and he did this, I don't know if regretfully or not, but Paul did this amazing thing. He started boasting about what God had allowed him to go through. And he was boasting to show his credentials, so to speak. Now, he could have showed his credentials by saying, God called me as I was pursuing Christians. God called me, struck me down, had me baptized. That is my credentials. But indeed, he chose to look at the suffering that he had gone through. Let's take a look at those that he listed. It's in 2 Corinthians 11, for those of you that are following along in the scripture. And it's going to be on the screen. And it's from a different translation than what you would be reading. And it says this. I know I sound like a madman, because, but I have served him far more, served him far more than the false, the false uh, uh, the gospel preachers at that time, the ones that were saying he was not uh, a true apostle. I have worked harder. I have been put into prison more often. I have been whipped times without number and faced death again and again. Five different times, the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. 40 was, was uh, legal, but they didn't want to surpass 40. 
Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. And there we have a connection, don't we? Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced dangers from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. I have faced dangers from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. And yet, he can say, all of this, all of this suffering brings perseverance. And all of this perseverance brings character. And this character brings hope. Hope is the life that we are given. There is a way of life called hope. I have a little, just a tiny little story that perhaps catch something of what is going on when we suffer. So for those of you that are hurting, especially right now, and for those of you who are comforting those that are hurting, suffering will come into our lives, has come into our lives, and perhaps is right now in our life. And it's like pain, in a sense. And I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but sometimes, and it works, it does work a little bit easier, a little better when the pain is not excruciating, it's just terrible. So when you, when, when you feel the pain, and instead of fighting the pain and saying, I can't stand that, I can't put up with that pain, it's an acceptance of that pain and saying, thank you, body, for telling me that I stuck my finger in the wrong place. Thank you for telling me that my body is hurting. Now, Lord, I pray, heal my body. So when we suffer, we say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for the hope that you give, that through the hope that you give, I have, I can persevere, and through the perseverance, I develop character, and character increases, and through the character that I have, I have hope in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Highlights of the movie.